So, to recall what uh, the point we had stopped at last time, we discovered that uh, the correlation, the uh, response function phi a b of tau which was formally equal to the equilibrium expectation value of a of 0 b of tau in equilibrium. We wrote this in a number of ways in terms of trace with rho equilibrium with a of 0 bracket with b of tau and so on. We had several representations for it, but we discovered that this became equal to in classical mechanics it reduced to just the correlation between a dot at 0 and b at time tau in equilibrium this was classically quantum mechanically we had a somewhat more complicated formula and quantum mechanically it was equal to trace well it was equal to an integral from 0 to beta d lambda and then trace of rho equilibrium times e to the lambda h naught a of 0 a dot of 0 e to the minus lambda h naught and then a b of tau like this and this was in quantum. This was the quantum mechanical case. So, it is like some kind of Adamar transform with the e to the lambda h naught here minus lambda h naught and then integrated over lambda from 0 to beta in this fashion and then you take the trace with this fellow here. Okay. It is very convenient this whole combination appears over and over again. So, it is very convenient to give it a small uh, a notation introduce some notation, but notice that in the classical case where things commute with each other this will cancel against that you just have a dot of 0 this gives you an integral beta and that gives you this factor and you are back to this out here. So, classically this formula reduces to the classical formula, but this is the more general formula here. So, it is convenient to introduce what is called a canonical correlation. So, let us define x y in equilibrium with arbitrary time arguments whatever be the time arguments of these dynamical variables if x and y are observables operators in the quantum case define this to be equal to 1 over beta times an integral 0 to beta d lambda and then trace rho equilibrium x sorry e to the lambda h naught x e to the minus lambda h naught y. So, define with a semicolon here I do not want to put a comma because that stands for things like Poisson brackets and so on or a commutator, but define this x y for arbitrary time arguments of the observables x and y it is just defined in this fashion here. Then this thing here in the quantum case becomes equal to this thing here becomes equal to beta times as you can see it becomes a dot of 0 semicolon b of tau. By definition, so this whole rigmarole with rho equilibrium which is e to the this quantity remember is e to the minus beta h naught normalized such that the trace of this quantity is 1. So, this makes sure that 
both the classical and quantum cases look alike. In the classical case, the semicolon is just deleted, it is just gone. It reduces to just the product. In the quantum case, you have to order these operators in this careful fashion here. Okay. Now, the advantage of doing this is that this response function has a very compact form now. So, it immediately tells you that there is a very important formula that the generalized susceptibility corresponding to these observables chi a b of omega has the compact form integral 0 to infinity d tau e to the i omega tau phi a b of tau but that is beta times a dot of 0 b of tau in equilibrium. So that is a very compact formula and then the job reduces to computing this number. In a sense, this summarizes all of linear response theory, the, the, the derivation of this formula here, where this semicolon bracket has this very specific meaning. Here, okay. Now, what is the advantage of doing this? Well, this thing here has a lot of interesting properties. To start with, it is stationary, immediately follows that it is stationary, because let us see what happens to it. This thing here, I want to show that x of any arbitrary t naught y of t naught plus t equilibrium. We want to show if it is stationary, it means you can subtract the same time argument from both time arguments here, same constant and you get the same answer. So, this will be equal to x of 0 y of t naught t alone that is stationarity. So, this is equal to I urge you to try and saw, show that this is so. What would you do? You would go back to the definition, you would go back to this thing here, put in the time arguments in these places and then we know what x of t naught does. For instance, this quantity here is equal to e to the i h naught t over h cross x of 0, sorry, t naught over h cross e to the minus i h naught t naught over h cross. That is the meaning of x of t naught in the Heisenberg picture driven by an evolution governed by the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Okay. So, for this quantity substitute this in the bracket in the definition of this uh, semicolon for this quantity x of t naught put in this quantity because we finally want to show that something involves x of 0 alone. Then for the y part put in the same thing but with t naught plus t in the exponents. So, you get a long big expression here and then remember that h naught commutes with itself. So, e to the a h naught commutes with e to the b h naught where a and b are scalar numbers. So, you can move those two brackets around those two factors around. And then use the cyclic invariance of the trace. Whether operators commute or not, trace A B is trace B A always. So, you should take certain packages, certain parts of this, certain blocks of these operators, and you can transfer it to the left. You may do that, you should get this back again. Okay. So, all the H naughts will go away except the one that involves this time argument with y and you should get this expression here. Okay. You could also further write this as x of minus t y of 0. You can subtract anything, same argument, same constant can be subtracted from the two time arguments in this two, two point correlation. Okay. So, the first important property of this quantity is stationarity that helps a great deal. Okay. 
the second property is symmetry and this follows in the following in the following way so let me show this so the first property is stationarity and the second property is x independent of what time argument you have regardless of what time argument you have x of anything y of anything else so let's let's call it x of uh, t1 y of t2 independent of what t1 and t2 are by the way this is a function of t1 minus t2 alone this quantity is equal to y of t2 x of t1 so there is the symmetry property which is a huge help because it says you can actually commute these fellows around when you have this uh, susceptible when you have this response function here for this this formula for phi a b you can it does not matter which order you put this thing in okay. Now how would you go about showing that well we really have to go back here and show that this is equal to y x independent of time arguments so let us start at this point and this is just a mathematical trick so it is not very uh, let us let us write it out here x semicolon y in equilibrium equal to 1 over beta that is irrelevant 0 to beta d lambda trace e to the minus beta h naught e to the lambda h naught x e to the minus lambda h naught y that is this quantity x semicolon y I want to show it is y semicolon x so clearly I am going to exploit the cyclic property of the trace bringing something here and putting it on this side. So how do you go about it I need these lambdas to act on this y but remember that these two factors do not these two do not commute because they do not commute with x necessarily of course these two commute these two do not commute and so on. So h naught x and y in general are operators which do not commute with each other how would you then produce this how would you get this across this fellow here is a trick pardon me change of integration variable exactly so set let us set beta minus lambda to be the variable of integration then this is a minus d lambda prime if you put lambda prime is equal to beta minus lambda the integration runs from 0 to beta here so the minus sign cancels and so this thing is the same as 1 over beta integral 0 to beta d lambda trace e to the minus beta h naught e to the instead of lambda I should write beta minus lambda okay just changing variables of integration I remove the prime after I change the variables. So these factors go away and you have e to the minus lambda h naught here and now move this across to this side so you have e to the minus beta h naught y e to the lambda h naught oh sorry h naught so I move this whole block as it is e to the lambda h naught y and that is gone. this is y semicolon x so there is a change of variable here change integration variable to beta minus lambda and that gives you the symmetry property so 
you can see the great advantage of defining the semicolon bracket because it is almost behaving classically. You can put these two fellows in either order, you do not care. It is stationary, it is symmetric. And once you have that notation in place, then actually you can play around with it as if these are classical objects, provided you have a semicolon in between. And it has got another very important property, the third one, which is the following. I expect, I expect that this, uh, if A and B are observables, they are represented by Hermitian operators, if they are physical observ real physical observables. I then expect that if I apply a real force, the response should be real, real quantity. So I want certain reality properties of this whole thing. I want, I would like to show that the response function must satisfy certain symmetry properties in order that the response to a real force be real, okay. So let us do that in slow steps. Let us first take what happens if you take the complex conjugate of this semicolon bracket. So let us find x semicolon y equilibrium star complex conjugate. This is equal to 1 over beta 0 to beta d lambda e to the my trace. H naught is function. Sorry. Trace of this fellow. Pardon me. Oh yeah, this is plus uh, and this is minus. Thank you. Right. And I need the Hermitian conjugate of this, so that's equal to one over beta integral zero to beta d lambda trace. And then of course when I take the Hermitian conjugate of a product of operators, they appear in the reverse order. So now we are looking at what happens if A and B are, X and B are, Y are Hermitian. So X equal to X dagger, Y equal to Y dagger. These are physical observables. So once I have this, all I have to do is to reverse the order, so it is equal to y, y dagger is the same as y, h naught is Hermitian, the Hamiltonian, so e to the minus beta h naught is Hermitian, that is this fellow and then x and then this fellow and then this guy. Now the same trick as before, we change variables of integration. So this is 1 over beta integral 0 to beta d lambda trace y e to the minus. So I am going to instead of lambda, I am going to set e, lambda prime is beta minus lambda. So lambda is beta minus lambda prime. So minus lambda is minus beta plus lambda prime. And then this h is e to the beta h naught e to the minus lambda h naught. Is there an extra beta h naught somewhere? Yes, that is okay. It is okay. 
Now this factor cancels against this because it commutes through H naught here. So where are we now? Yes. Yes. Now it's a simple matter. Take y to the end. So take this fellow and take it all the way to the end there. So this is equal to So the third property is reality. The response function therefore written in this form is stationary, symmetric and real. Real for Hermitian operators. That immediately implies a certain symmetry property here. So you will see what the consequence of it is. The consequence is that so this quantity is real if A dot and B are Hermitian. Instead of X, I call it A dot. Instead of Y, I call it B. We have just seen that it is real if A dot and B are Hermitian. Okay. Now, what appears in the Hamiltonian, if you recall, is this. Remember our perturbation or our total Hamiltonian was equal to H was H naught minus A F of T. This was the operator that appeared, not A dot. A dot came because of manipulations in between. Okay. So A is certainly a Hermitian operator. I apply real force to the system. H naught is a Hermitian operator. A is a physical observable. And the Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian, so this is Hermitian here. But what is the guarantee that A dot is Hermitian? How do I know that if A is Hermitian, the operator A dot is also Hermitian? I mean, this, I mean, this sounds like common sense, right? Because if, uh, after all, if uh, A is the position, A dot is a velocity and that is as real or as physical as the position itself. But what is the guarantee in general that for some arbitrary observable A which is Hermitian represented by Hermitian operator, what is the guarantee that the operator A dot is also a Hermitian operator? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So you would write A dot, the operator A dot at any time is equal to This is Hermitian, that is Hermitian. So is the commutator Hermitian? Pardon me? Anti-Hermitian. Anti commutator of two op Hermitian operators is anti-Hermitian, of course, because AB minus BA becomes BA minus AB when you take the Hermitian conjugate, right? That is saved by this guy. That changes sign 2. Therefore, if A is Hermitian, A dot is Hermitian. The commutator of two physical op observables represented by Hermitian operators has to be anti Hermitian. And you put another i there, it becomes Hermitian. Okay. So we are in good shape. This says this is real if A dot and B are Hermitian operators. Now, if I apply a real force to a real system, to a system, I expect a real response. Hmm? On the other hand, I know that. Uh, I know the following. I know that if I apply a force F naught e to the minus i omega t to the system, this was my general force expression for a particular frequency omega, right? So the force was this implies a response chi a b of omega f naught e to the minus i omega t. That is the response. That is how it defined the generalized susceptibility. It was the quantity that attenuated the force which 
was applied with one particular value of frequency. Any frequency component, if the force had an amplitude f0, the response was the same thing multiplied by this generalized susceptibility, right. So if the force, and it is a linear response, so if the force is f0 star e to the plus i omega t, if that is the force, then what should the response be? You can read it off from here. The force has got a term sinusoidal oscillation e to the plus i omega t, right. So the response has to be chi a b of minus omega. F naught star e to the i omega t. It has to be so because it is linear response. I can put whatever amplitude I like, whatever frequency I like and compare with this. If I add these two fellows, if I add these two forces, then what do I get? It immediately implies therefore if the force is F naught e to the i omega t plus F naught star e to, e to the minus i omega t, e to the i omega t over 2, hmm, I take e, half the amplitude in each case, must imply a response chi a b of omega f naught e to the minus i omega t plus chi a b of minus omega f naught star e to the i omega t divided over by 2. But this object here is real, it is a real part of, so this whole thing where it says the real part of f naught e to the minus i omega t. So that is a real force, the response has to be real. So this must be the real part of some complex number, be almost there, here is f naught, here is f naught star, here is e to the i minus i omega t plus i omega t. So this would be real. So this is equal, this part equal to the real part of chi of omega, chi a b of omega f naught e to the minus i omega t provided if and only if this part is the complex conjugate of this guy, there is no other way. If and only if chi a b of minus omega equal to chi a b star of omega, right. You see the argument, all I have used is a superposition principle and the definition of the generalized susceptibility, okay. And that leads me to the conclusion that if I apply a real force, a physical force, then the response is real if A and B are Hermitian if and only if this condition is satisfied for real omega. But let us look at what the complex conjugate is. This implies that chi a b of star of omega, this quantity here, I take complex conjugate this must be equal to beta times integral 0 to infinity d tau e to the minus i omega tau, right, times this quantity phi a b, this was equal to apart from this beta, this fellow here was equal to phi a b of tau, right. So this is equal to out here a dot of 0 
B of tau equilibrium complex conjugated because I am taking the complex conjugate. So this however is equal to chi A B of minus omega provided this is equal to its own complex conjugate. provided that is real. But we just saw that for Hermitian operators that is real. Okay. So the physical reason why you want that response function to be real is that it ensures that when you are dealing with the susceptibility involving Hermitian physical operators, you apply a real perturbation, the response also is real that is guaranteed by the fact that this uh, correlation function even in the quantum case we do not care even there it is real guaranteed to be real otherwise we would be in trouble okay. it would lead to an inconsistency. So that is good that we have seen that the reality of this quantity this response function ensures that the susceptibility has this symmetry property which is needed to ensure that the response to a real force is real. Now the consequence of this in turn is immediate. So again now we are specializing to A and B or A dot and B permission. So and hence A dot and B chi a b star of omega equal to chi a b of minus omega. I want to emphasize that this, this of course we have assumed omega to be real. When I took the complex conjugate of this quantity I just put e to the minus i omega tau which would only be true if omega is real. Time of course is real so there is no problem tau is real but we want to make sure omega is also kept real hmm? because very soon in a minute we are going to talk about complex omega. Okay. Oh, by the way this implies immediately that the real part of chi a b of omega equal to the real part of chi a b of minus omega. Take real parts on both sides and you see that it is a symmetric function. The imaginary part chi a b of omega equal to minus the imaginary part chi a b of minus omega. It is an odd function. So, this is an even function and that is an odd function. It is going to be useful. right. So there are these symmetry properties this is going to be useful because physically you talk about real values of omega which are also positive non-negative but we are going to talk about analytic properties in omega in the omega plane which will involve integrals over negative values of omega but they can be got rid of by using these properties. So you can fold things back onto the positive real axis. Now, yeah, I, I very often want it to do the opposite. I want, I want to draw contour integrals and so on. So we'll see. We'll go back and forth. The point is that if you know this quantity for some positive omega, you also know it for negative omega by this symmetry property. Okay, but now there's a very interesting property of. Uh, analytic behavior and let me do this by motivating it starting with this formula which is this one. So
and we have seen that this is real for Hermitian uh, a, and, a and B and therefore A dot and B. We have seen that it is symmetric in A and B exchange and we have seen that it uh, is real, symmetric and stationary. Okay. Now, if this integral exists for real values of omega, this is an oscillatory factor then in general this should go to 0 as tau goes to infinity so that the integral converges. Okay. If that is so, if I add a converging factor to it then the integral gets more and more convergent. So if this exists, if this exists and that is by no means guaranteed we do not know for sure we got to look at it. If this exists for real omega then take by exist I mean if it is convergent for real omega, it will certainly do so for imaginary omega greater than 0. So I make omega complex purely as a mathematical exercise. I know physical frequencies are real but here is a formula which is a function of omega. And now I say alright very nice let me talk think about this in terms of the complex variable omega hmm? purely as a mathematical excursion there will be a reason for doing so. Then the question is does it exist does it make sense well in general if you are familiar with the theory of analytic continuation then you know that if something is analytic in the complex variable sense on some dense set then you actually have or some continuous set of some suitable kind of set in the complex plane then you can define in general analytic continuations of this function to the rest of the complex plane or to some region of the complex plane called the domain of whatever holomorphy or something. But now we will look at this very heuristically if I put omega equal to omega 1 plus i omega 2 then this factor e to the i omega tau becomes e to the i omega 1 tau times e to the minus omega 2 tau. So there is an extra damping factor provided omega 2 is positive. Omega 2 is the imaginary part of omega and if it is positive then since tau runs only over positive values you are guaranteed that this provides you with an extra convergence factor out here. It is crucially dependent on the fact that tau runs only over positive values if tau had gone to minus infinity then this is finished you, you cannot do this okay. So this means that the formula as it stands makes sense even for complex omega as long as the real imaginary part of omega is positive in other words as long as you move into the upper half plane. So what we have is a situation where in the complex omega plane this is omega 1 and that is omega 2 the imaginary part you have assumed this formula all along the real axis and you have said by assumption that this formula defines for you a function of omega through this convergent integral for all real omega. It follows as a consequence of that assumption that if you move up into the complex omega plane throughout up here at any value of omega to find the value of this function at that value of omega all you got to do is to substitute that value of omega in this formula and it makes sense. So the formula provides an analytic continuation into the upper half plane. So this thing here can be con analytically continued, continued
and moreover you are guaranteed it defines an analytic function there. You can therefore differentiate it any number of times as you know an analytic function of a complex variable is a very special kind of function. It means it satisfies the Cauchy Riemann conditions between the real and imaginary parts. It means that every derivative of this function exists and is also an analytic function satisfying the Cauchy Riemann condition. There is a Cauchy integral formula for this and then you also know that the line integral of this function round any closed contour is provided the contour stays entirely in the region of analyticity and does not enclose any singularities the answer is 0. So, is everybody familiar with these theorems? Okay. So, once we have that in place then it provides a very powerful handle. It says if you start anywhere and you draw a closed contour like this C, the integral of d omega let me drop this subscript a b all the time because it is true for any a and b as long as whatever properties you have established so far are true. So, let us for convenience simplicity in notation drop this and just call it chi of omega this over this contour c is equal to 0 provided c does not get anywhere into the lower half plane provided it remains in the region of analyticity of this function which is the upper half plane and the real axis by assumption. So, that is a consequence of Cauchy's theorem integral formula or whatever you call it. It is a consequence of the fact that this thing is a nice analytic function. Okay. So, now suppose you start with some value of omega on the real axis which we are interested in. Let us suppose I start with some fixed value of omega here and I want to choose another symbol for the integration symbol. So, let me call this omega and let me call this real omega prime and this is imaginary omega prime. I want to make sure and this is certainly true. Now, I can distort this contour as I please provided I never come down below here and what I would like to do is to use this property to derive a formula and that is the target for chi at this point, this physical point in terms of an integral over chi over the rest of the real axis. Okay. And the way to do that is to single out this point here. How do I single it out? But I should ensure that chi of omega becomes a residue of some function of omega prime at this point. So, I should therefore divide by omega prime minus omega. So, let us consider the analytic function chi of omega prime divided by omega prime minus omega in the omega prime plane as a function of omega prime. This fellow is analytic on and above the real axis. This provides a simple pole at omega prime equal to omega. So, this function itself is analytic everywhere in the upper half plane except for a pole at this point and it has a simple pole out here. As long as I do not cross that pole or hit that pole, I can distort this contour as I please provided I do not go into the lower half plane. So, let me start distorting it without changing the value of the integral. So, I start by saying an integral over this contour c d omega prime equal to 0 to start with because it is an analytic function. If c looks like what I drew earlier but I can make that c look bigger by writing it like this. Okay. I can make this go on the real axis because it is still analytic there, 
but for clarity I have shown it a little above. I should avoid this pole, so I go above it and stay in the region of holomorphy and I go to this side and do this thing. and the answer is still 0. I would like to do this till I extend this to infinity and take an inf infinitely large semicircle. Am I allowed to do that? How do you know? How do you know? Because I am going to have to argue that this contribution I would like it to go to 0. Is that going to happen? Is that going to happen? I have assumed that it exists, but I have not said anything about what it does as omega prime goes to infinity along any direction. Pardon me? Chi is independent of one. There is no phi anymore, right? I am just saying this is an analytic function. So I am only focusing on this function now as a whole. Phi is gone. I mean, it is represented by this. So I am just saying this is an analytic function of omega prime in the upper half plane with a pole at omega prime equal to omega on the real axis. Everywhere else in the upper half plane, it is analytic. So, am I allowed to say that if I write a contour integral from minus r to plus r, this is plus r and then this big semicircle, it is still valid, this is still true. Can I take r equal to infinity? Am I allowed to do that? Hmm? I have the exponential, where is the exponential factor? That has been used up in showing that this is analytic, that is gone. Okay. So, when is the contribution from that semicircle? So, let us write it out. Let us call this contribution from the semicircle. Let us call this contour gamma, big gamma. So, this quantity is integral minus r to omega minus epsilon plus an integral from r, uh, omega plus epsilon to r plus an integral over gamma. of the same thing chi of omega prime d omega prime over omega prime minus 1. I am going to let r go to infinity. So, this integral runs minus infinity to infinity except for that little interval around omega and then I would like this to be 0. Is that guaranteed? Think about it till tomorrow since we have run out of time think about. Otherwise, it would not be useful because it would still involve integrals over some complex values of omega. I want to restrict it to real values, physical values of omega. Right? So, I want this contribution to vanish and you have to tell me what further assumption is needed to do this. So, we will take it from here tomorrow. <coughs>